Moinsen, this is Sebastian, and here you see me playing GTA 5 on my original unmodified Game Boy. No clickbait, no video tricks, all documented and open source. Well, to avoid misunderstandings, let me clarify what you just saw. I am playing GTA 5 on the Game Boy, but it's not running on the Game Boy. The game is rendered on my PlayStation and streamed to the Game Boy via Wi-Fi. Conversely, if I press a button on the Game Boy, the input is sent back to the PlayStation so I can control the game. This may seem trivial, but an unmodified Game Boy just is not designed to play video or even show full screen images, as I will explain later. But before we get to this, I should also clarify that this here is a follow up video to my previous one. Because the magic hardware that allows me to stream GTA to an unmodified Game Boy is the Wi Fi Game Boy cartridge, which I presented last time. In this video here, I will mostly explain technical details at the Game Boy end and finally show a few videos and games that you requested. If you want to understand everything, you should watch the other video first. But if you're just here for the show, sit back, grab some popcorn and enjoy the video. Oh, and as always, I will release the source code and some more technical details on my blog at There Ought To Be. So, Wi-Fi communication and sending data to the Game Boy was already possible in the last video. Do we now just send an animated GIF to the Game Boy? Ah, it's more complicated. Let's go one step back and look at how to even draw an ordinary image on the Game Boy. Because it turns out that you cannot do it in full screen except for some kind of trick. The thing is that the Game Boy does not have a method to draw individual pixels. It has a so-called pixel processing unit or PPU with some very specific drawing functions. Basically, you have a set of numbered background tiles and a so-called tile map that combines these tiles into a background image. Then you have a set of sprites from which you can draw up to 40 freely on top of the background. And there are some additional features, for example to draw scoreboards and once again I want to recommend the Ultimate Game Boy Talk by Michel Steil if you want to learn more about these. But there's nothing to directly draw specific pixels onto the screen. This is why most Game Boy games have this distinct look. Stuff is arranged on a grid with repeating tiles and players and monsters are moving on top. So in order to draw an arbitrary image we have to split it into tiles which are each 8x8 pixels. With a color depth of 2 bits to make up the 4 shades of grey that the original Game Boy offers, each tile takes up 16 bytes and we then have to create a tile map that simply puzzles the tiles back together to recreate the original image. Right? Almost. There is a little catch. The tile map only uses one byte per tile to define which image should be drawn, so it can only select from 256 distinct tiles. But the Game Boy has a resolution of whopping 160 by 144 pixels, which translates to 20 by 18 tiles. So we require a total of 360 tiles, which incidentally is more than 256. If you look at the title screens of most games, you will notice that usually this means that those screens either reuse several tiles or that they just have a lot of empty space around them. This workaround is okay if you specifically design a title screen for the Game Boy, but not if you want to display arbitrary images or videos. Luckily, there's a well-known workaround for this. You can select the memory range for the background tiles by changing a bit in the display status register. The 256 values of the tile map can either point to the memory address hex 8000 and count upwards from there, or they can point to the address hex 9000 and the bytes are interpreted as signed integers, allowing it to point to 128 tiles after and 128 tiles before that address. Yes, the ones before that address overlap with the other range. This gives us 128 tiles that are only available in one state, 128 tiles in the other state and 128 tiles that are shared between both states. 384 in total, which incidentally is more than 360. So if you have the data for 360 tiles in memory, you can use a tile map with addresses relative to hex 8000 for the upper half of the screen and addresses relative to hex 9000 for the lower half. Since the PPU draws the image line by line, you can actually register an interrupt that allows you to simply change the display status register halfway through the image to switch to the other address. Now, while this method is known among Game Boy developers, you still do not often see full screen images because the capacity of a cartridge is rather limited. In our case, with a Wi Fi cartridge, that's not an issue. But each image of the video will require different tile data, so we ideally want to load those 360 tiles about 25 to 30 times per second. With 16 bytes per tile, 
that's a total of 5760 bytes per frame and at 30 FPS that would mean 168 kilobyte per second. In the Game Boy world, that's a lot of data. That's about 8 times the entire Tetris game per second. So, no more comfortable C, it's time for some hand-to-hand -hand assembly. I am not the most experienced with assembly code, but I can copy a block of data from one location to another one with three repeating lines which take up a total of six CPU cycles. In case of my Wi-Fi cartridge, we always read from the same memory address, which allows me to cut it down to two repeating lines with only four cycles. If someone knows a faster way on the original Game Boy, which does not support DMA on its video RAM, please let me know. So, for 5760 bytes, I would need roughly 23,000 CPU cycles. For the 1 MHz CPU, this would allow for more than 40 frames per second, if it wasn't for another limitation of the Game Boy. You see, the PPU of the Game Boy draws the image like an old CRT would do it, line by line, from left to right, and from top to bottom. But while it is doing so, it needs to read from video RAM, and does not allow the CPU to write to it. The CPU is only allowed to write to video RAM in a short period between each line called H blank and during a slightly longer period between each frame called V blank. Without going into all the technical details, when only drawing background tiles, I get 68 microseconds or 71 cycles for each of the 144 lines and about an additional millisecond or 1140 cycles during V blank in which I can transfer the tile data. If you punch in those numbers, that makes a total of 11,364 cycles per frame. So, even if I manage to use them all perfectly, the 23,000 cycles for the full image do not quite fit into two frames. I need three frames per image, and since the Game Boy refreshes 60 times per second, I end up with 20 FPS for my video stream. On the bright side, using three frames per image now leaves some headroom and allows us to organize the transfer nicely. One tile with 16 bytes fits neatly into H blank and so I can transfer one tile per line using only H blank and consistent 16 byte packages. In contrast to my previous video, this also allows the ESP to send these 16 bytes without waiting for interrupts right after the Game Boy sends one initial read request just before H blank begins. This way, even with the entire Game Boy code written in highly optimized assembly, the ESP8266 can keep up with the data transfer. Oh, and all that headroom allows us to send one byte from the Game Boy to the ESP every three frames when one image is complete to synchronize them in case something goes out of sync. This can be done regardless of video RAM access and we will use this later for a back channel. But that's enough theory for now. Let's fire up a Python script that takes any video source from FFmpeg, reorders the bits to match the tile data order and streams it to the cartridge. It's finally time to look at some of your requests. Ok, what do we have here? Ah, the matrix, the way it was meant to be seen. Well, at least the color scheme seems quite right. What's next? A YouTube stream. Now what should we watch? Ah, the nerd seems appropriate. He will certainly find a few kind words to describe the image quality. Then we have... Bad Apple. Wow, this actually looks good. Missing the music though. Remember that audio pin I dismissed as weird in the last video? Yeah, now I wish I had hooked it up to something properly, because that would have allowed me to also play audio. Same problem with the next request. Rick Astley, never gonna give you up. Huh, maybe I should learn to drive the Game Boy sound chip and follow up on this one later. Ok, now for the big finale, the epitome of Game Boy hacking, the apotheosis of yeah, I spoiled it already to get you to click on the video, didn't I? Alright. Remember the one byte we are writing from the Game Boy to the ESP? The one I said we would use for synchronization and which could be used as a back channel? Well, let's use it to send the state of the Game Boy controls. 8 bits, 8 buttons. The ESP passes it through to the Python script, which can now react to the Game Boy's button presses and create any fake input on the PC. At this point, the Game Boy can be a screen for anything and it can be an input device for anything. Working through the remaining requests is now as complicated as buying the game on Steam or installing a client for my PlayStation's Remote Play. Let's do a few, shall we? How about a Super Nintendo emulator? Beautiful. Gives you a perspective of how advanced that thing was. Of course, here's GTA 5 in glorious 160 by 144 pixels. So advanced. A feast for your eyes. 
and it's so easy to control with only a D-pad and four buttons. What else? Ah, why do you all have an obsession for crisis? Well, why not? Top resolution, such sharpness. And doom. Hmm. Okay, I will do it, but this feels a bit wrong. You see, Doom is the go-to demo to run on a device and I'm not running Doom on the Game Boy. I am just playing it on the Game Boy. I don't want to see this mixed up, alright? If any lazy news blog gets this wrong, you got to set it straight, okay? Write them a strongly worded comment. Well, here it is then, Doom. What a sight. Okay, that's it. I think I made it clear that I can pretty much do anything with the Game Boy now, as long as there is a PC on the network to do the actual work. Now, before everyone asks the one question I always get, no, I do not produce and sell this cartridge. It requires a lot more effort to design a product that can be sold than something that works as a demo on your own desk. And also, this is just a hobby. But don't despair, I publish the hardware design and all the code on there ought to be. So if you want to build it yourself or if you want to refine it further, look for links in the description. I would love to see what you do with it. And since this cartridge gets so much attention and I cannot answer all the comments, I will do a live Q&A session on the 28th of January. I will announce further details on all channels. And with that, I'm out. Ciao.